Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Alex Wolf here, joined by a very special guest today. I've got the host of Locked On Blazers, Mike Richmond, to talk about, you guessed it, Malcolm Brogdon, because he is a Knicks trade target. So we're going to get into how Brogdon's been for Portland this year, what a trade could look like, pick his brain about a couple role players. He picks my brain about Quentin Grimes. And then we, of course, figure out some mock trades. So that's coming up next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode because we are here for you guys five days a week, if not more. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor in chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. And like I said, joined today by Mike Richmond of Locked On Blazers. There's a lot of great conversation. So let's get right into it. It is crossover time, locked on Knicks and locked on Blazers. And you know what time it is. It's trade season. This is why we we got to do this. We got to, you know, talk out some mock trades because when else are we going to get to do this? Well, maybe in the off season, but like right now we've got like a month, if that, to get this done and, and have some fun and do some mock trades. And this is honestly one of my favorite parts of the podcast. Uh, of course, I'm Alex Wolf. He's Mike Richmond of locked on Blazers, me of locked on Knicks. And, uh, Mike, let me. Uh, I think there's one name that really jumps out here that we need to talk about first and foremost. Evan and that's Malcolm Fournier. Brockton. Oh, okay. <laughs> Evan Fournier. Oh, yeah, Evan Fournier. Of course, the the shooting threat that the the Blazers need right now to uh, save yeah. their season. <laughs> he's uh, fresh. I'll tell you that he's fresh. He's certainly fresh. He's got very low mileage this year. You know, can I interest yeah. you in a in a low mileage Evan Fournier? Um, yeah. In, in exchange for Malcolm Brogdon. Uh, but Brogdon, just for a quick statistical primer, is averaging about 15 points, five assists, three boards this year, shooting 43% from the field, 41% from three on pretty decent volume, which is a staple for him in his career at this point, uh, 77.5% from the free throw line. Um, so I guess, Mike, my first thing would just be, uh, what are your thoughts about the Knicks' trade partners here? Because like, like, what's the market shaping out for as far as Brogdon, like as we're recording this, it seems like Siakam is probably going to get traded in the next like 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it, things are starting to open up a little bit because the Knicks obviously made the trade for OG, which sort of was like the first foray of trade season. And the Knicks obviously are still going to want to do business. But I would imagine that Portland's probably getting a, a, at least rumored a, a lot of interest for Brogdon right now, right? Yeah, thanks to the the magic of the play in tournaments, uh, there are more teams that buy into the nonsense, right? There's more teams that say like, we, you know what, we believe, and then like you see the Lakers make the you know a couple play in teams, the the Lakers and the Heat like make make deep playoff runs, and it's like there's reason to believe if we're a veteran team, we can get right, and if we finish, you know somewhere in the top 10 will any anything can happen. So you have you just have more teams that are like in the mix. And while there are some truly terrible teams in the league, uh, including the one that I cover every day on my podcast, the Portland Trailblazers, God bless them. Uh, like there aren't a, there there aren't a ton of sellers, right? It seems like, like you said, Pascal Siakam's a seller, or the Raptors with Siakam are sellers. It seems like Dejounte Murray in Atlanta, the, the Hawks are going to be sellers. Um, what do the Wizards have to sell? What do the Pistons have to sell? What do the what do the Spurs have to sell? Like, right? They don't have uh, Doug McDermott, I guess. Like, but it's like and and Bogdanovich, and but is it, are they going to trade Kyle Kuzma? But you get to you is a pretty is a pretty thin line. So the Blazers are one of the few teams that are going to be sellers. And so I think they are truly motivated to move off Brogdon. Um, I have been saying on my show that they have to trade Malcolm Brogdon. Does the front office feel as strongly as I do? I don't know. But, but from my perspective, have to. It is imperative that Malcolm Brogdon is no longer on the roster after the trade deadline. And that's not because he's not a nice fellow. And it's not because he's not a good basketball player. It's precisely because he is good at basketball that he has to go play for another team. The Blazers have young guards. They got young guards galore. Uh, if, if there's one thing that they have, it's youth that needs to dribble. 
Anthony Simons, Scoot Henderson, uh, Shane Sharp, who's going to be hurt for a couple is out for a couple weeks because he's hurt, but he's going to come back and he's better with the ball in his hands. They got to just have a way for all those dudes to play 35 minutes and particularly all those dudes to play at the end of the game. And the way to do that is to trade Malcolm Brogdon. And I think he'll have suitors. Why does he appeal to the Knicks? Uh, so really they have a rather large Emmanuel quickly sized hole in the bench unit now. <laughs> Uh, since I, there's no denying that the OG trade has made the Knicks a better team. You know, I, sure. I think that that's undeniable. And if they're at full strength, like everybody's healthy, whatever, we've seen some cracks now with like, ugh, if one of Brunson or Randall gets hurt, things get pretty rough for a couple games. We've seen it the last two games with Brunson hurt, even with Deuce McBride kind of stepping up. It's like, nah, like they, they desperately need someone that can back up Brunson and make it so that Deuce is backing up that person. If right. Brunson gets hurt or whatever, you know what I mean? And I think that's why they're in the market for Brogdon. Like he, it's really ironic because we spent, <laughs> Gavin and I spent most of the last season kind of crapping on Brogdon and being like the, the unworthy six man winner, you know, it should have been Emmanuel quickly, blah, blah, blah. But you know, they pretty much do very similar things. Uh, they, they come in off the, or at least, you know, it, in the role that the Knicks had quickly and obviously similar flavors, play. I would say for sure. Yeah. They're, right. they're not yeah, that similar players, but similar flavor for sure. Exactly. Uh, although one is, you know, like, almost 10 years older than the other, you know, that plays into it a little bit, you know, as far as like what their value is or whatever. But like, I think that really, they just need that creation off the bench. They really need like a third guy that can just like make a, you know, like make his own shot and make shots for others, uh, which Brogdon is, is talented at. He has the pull up shooting. He has the, the ability to break down a defense and, you know, initiate things more so than Deuce McBride. He's getting better at it, but it's, I don't think he's going to get there at the level that the Knicks would need him to be at, to be just like the full-time backup guard or whatever, or, or particularly one that could potentially close games with Brunson and all that. Uh, so that's really why the Knicks are in on this. Like they, they need a guy like Brogdon and Brogdon. I think from the Knicks perspective, there's two guys that they're pretty heavily linked to and it's Brogdon and it's DeJounte Murray, who you mentioned already. And I, I think that Brogdon represents sort of the safer choice. And he's a guy that we've been talking about a lot lately, whereas Murray is more volatile, but a potentially higher upside swing, uh, but also one that might cost a little more. So it's like, right. are, you get, are you willing to put a little more in to potentially get a little more out, but also potentially have it flame out horribly like it has in Atlanta? Because, um, you know, people thought that would work out better. And there's all this data that says that he and Trey Young are worse, uh, like the team is worse with them both on the court than with either one of them off the court. And, you know, Brunson, I think, is better than Trey Young, but I, I think that you run into some similar problems as far as, like, who Brunson's able to guard and stuff like that. Even if he's not better, they're not so much different that it would be, like, a totally different experiment, you know, like exactly. in the grand scheme. Exactly. You, you want Jalen kind of Brunson to dribble and do stuff and, and and be the be the engine. You don't want him to watch. If he watches, he's worse. I mean, that's, that's just the truth of it. Right, exactly. So uh, having gotten about a half – a season with Brogdon so far, I'm going to throw this back to you as far as my little scouting expedition here. Uh, I have noticed that he has the lowest field goal percentage of his career so far this year, second worst true shooting percentage of his career so far. Uh, so I, I can think of explanations for this, given the situation that he's been thrust into. He went it's from a the, contender. It's the simple one. It's the simple one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he went from a contender on the Celtics last year to then getting traded to Portland and essentially, being told don't worry dude we'll find a new team for you at some point like but for now we're gonna hold on to you because we can't we can't do that right this second but so do you kind of mark this up to like veteran kind of semi mailing it in on a bad team doing just enough to like show that he still got it or do you think he legitimately looks like he's starting to lose a step because he is 31 years old at this point history of injuries all that good stuff but i i would just without even hearing your answer assume it's probably more of the former he just has bad coworkers. Like he just, he plays on a team with like, it's, it's, it's hard to run a pick and roll with Deandre Ayton who doesn't pop, doesn't roll hard to the rim, doesn't pass the ball well out of pick and rolls. It's hard to run a pick and roll when the spacers are scoot Henderson, maybe the worst shooter in the league, uh, but worst true shooting percentage of any player in the league. Scoot's going to be good y'all, but he's bad right now. Um, Jumani Kamara, who's, who's a starting small forward. He he's a terrible spacer. Um, you know, it's just, they, the offense is bad because they got bad players. Um, they've been the they've been the worst offense in the league all year long, and and Brogdon has felt that effect. Here's one for you though: Malcolm Brogdon on catch and shoot three pointers this year is shooting fifty two point eight percent. 
That's play the off the ball off of Jalen Brunson, and he makes more than half of his threes. That's on three attempts a game on, on catch and shoot threes. Yeah. 52.8%. Like, I'm not, drop him into a good ecosystem. And the Knicks are, if nothing else, uh, Tom Thibodeau and late career Tom Thibodeau is a freaking good offensive coach who saw it coming. But like they're that thing whirs when the Knicks get going like that. They are they really can hum on offense with the amount of playmakers they have. And you just stick Malcolm Brogdon off the ball like you need him for the creation stuff and he can do that. But you stick him as an off ball guy watching uh, Jew cook and watching uh, Brunson cook. You're fine. Run handoffs with Hardenstein. You're fine. He's going to be, he's, he's going to be good. He can play on ball. He can play off the ball. He can create a little bit. He's best when you just say go score. Like that's his best skill on offense. But if go score is stand there and be ready to shoot, he's going to make more than half of them. Yeah. I, I, uh, the Knicks love guys like that too, for what it's worth. I mean, Brunson is one of those guys. He's, he's great on catch and shoot as well as creating his own shot. Brogdon would fit into that. DiVincenzo, even he does most of his work in catch and shoot, but he has the ability to pull up and shoot. Like they love guys that can that can do exactly that. Deuce McBride, that's been one of the turning points for him in playing a lot better, is that he's finally unleashing and hitting the shots that he's taken, you know, pull-ups, but also is great at just being able to find a good position on the perimeter. So that's very encouraging. I will say, I think that there would be some opportunity for Brogdon. You know, he's gonna come off the bench, he's probably gonna spell Brunson first shift off the bench. But there, there would be a possibility for him to close some halves. Tibbs does tend to go hot hand uh, late in games, other than like his two big stars. Uh, he he likes to go hot hand and see who's who's playing well. And, you know, oftentimes, sometimes he makes the wrong decision, but oftentimes he'll, he'll be smart enough to be like, hey, this guy's shooting really well, so let's keep him out there. That could mean that he could be sharing the court with Brunson sometimes. So I guess my other question is positionally, I, and I mean, I know you've only had half a season on a, a tanking team here, but what losing, is his just defense? losing naturally? They're not, they'll tank later. Don't worry, they'll tank soon. Right now, they're, they're just losing naturally. Just losing natural natural losses. <laughs> but <laughs> what, defensively, do you like? I know he's a big. He's he's only six foot four, but he is he's a like a built dude. Yeah, he's uh, big. What has been his defensive role this year as far as like what positions he's been able to guard? Because I think more often than not on the Knicks, you'd probably be guarding twos and threes. And I wonder yeah. if that would be an issue or not for him. They typically do have him guard up, actually. They have him guard up because they let Tumani Kamara guard the point of attack um, to, to guard like the, the little speedy ball handler types. So he'll guard wings. Um, even occasionally they've asked him to guard up uh, a little bit on power forwards. Like he, he, he weirdly finished a game guarding uh, Kevin Durant because they went small and it was like, okay, you guard Kevin Durant. Now that might be, I'll be honest with you, Alex, that just might be uh kind of how bad teams are is, is that sometimes they have, they get to a, they won that game by the way, but it's like they, they, you know, they get to the end of the game and Malcolm Brogdon is their best option to guard Kevin Durant because it's just how, it, how it shakes out. But he's guarded Kawhi a little bit. Like it, it's, he's not a lockdown defender by any means, but he's competent and competitive. Um, there are times when he looks slow on defense for sure. And I think there's been times this year when maybe his body language has looked like I'm a hostage, but um, I think for the most part, he has, been been fine on defense like he's 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 been fine on defense i think he's arguably not even arguably i think he's probably been the blazers best defensive guard um it's not a lot of competition for that spot between scoot anderson and Amphrey simons but i think he's been their best defensive guard um and and for the most part i think he could guard twos like in the in the league shooting guards aren't scary there's no there's no scary shooting guards that's where you hide people and i think you could be fine hiding him right there cool well Let's uh let's come back in in just a sec and we'll talk about uh a couple role players that I really dig because uh I want to I want to get into some some guys that maybe I don't know if this bargain bin shopping or whatever but I want to <laughs> just kind of throw some names out there and see what you think cuz I got to see the Blazers in person the other week and I was like hey you know a couple of these guys kind of popped so uh I'll talk about that in just a sec and throw a couple more names at you All right, I'll be right back in with Mike to continue talking about this potential trade scenario. Get a scouting report on one of my faves, Ibu Baji, that I grew to love in his one game against the Knicks. 
in just a sec. But first, I got to remind you all, today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need and the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, we're back in. And Mike, I got some other names to throw at you because, you know, I don't know, trades that happen sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you make a trade for OG Ananobi and you get pressure to chew in Malachi Flynn back. And then you get to have mixed reactions about those two guys that were <laughs> sort of throw-ins. And then you realize uh, some of the limitations that kind of made them throw-ins. Uh, but anyway, one guy that I would love if the Blazers would be willing to throw in to this deal is Ibu Baji. I, I got to I, I love that when you 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 said, hey, I want to do this show. Um, I want to talk about Ibu Baji. Of all the names on the Blazers <laughs> roster, you said I want to I want to make sure we get to I want to hey in the second segment, I want to make sure we get to Ibu Baji. I love it. T tell me, you saw him up close at MSG. You told me he had nice tickets. Tell me about the the Baji experience you had. Dude, he popped. In that game. And I mean, I don't even know what his final stats were, but I think he blocked Randall like four times. <laughs> like me and my friend were literally just sitting there being like, this dude is the Randall stopper. Like if he could stop Randall this many times, like just get him on my team. Like, cause Randall was playing really good at that point. Like he was on yeah. a real heater and Baji just like ate his lunch over and over. And it was kind of hilarious, but also made me go like, I, if the Knicks end up dealing for Malcolm Brogdon and they can get this dude as like a throw in more or less, because he's on a two way deal, right? He's a two way guy. Yeah. He's yeah. a rookie. He was on a two way last year, but he never appeared. He did not make an, his NBA debut. He had a back injury that had kept him out the most of last season. And then, um, the Blazers didn't sign him to a two-way coming out of camp. They went another direction. He came back when they made some roster moves. And so he's back. And now because of injuries to, to Rob Williams and DeAndre, and he's like their regular backup center. He's 21. He started playing basketball at about 15. Um, he's the first player to make it from the NBA Africa program to the league. Like he's a really fun story. Um, he played at uh, Barcelona's like B team is where he, where he first got to start out of Senegal. And um, he, he pops on defense. He definitely, he definitely brings energy on defense. He's, he is a rough on offense. Okay. That game though, against the Knicks, uh, he finished with four points, seven boards, three assists, two steals and two blocks. He was all over them, all over the place. So you can um, see why he popped, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, this is according to basketball reference game score. This is, uh, that is the second best game of evil Baji's career. So you, you literally saw one of the great Baji experiences that you possibly could have. Um, yeah, I I don't know that he could play big minutes in a high leverage game, but I know I think he's more valuable on the on the Blazers where they can like let him kind of run free and lose by 28 to the Knicks and appeal to people uh, appeal to fans in the arena. But but where where do you see him fitting necessarily? Well, so let me paint the picture for you. So okay, I looked at his yeah, stats. Yeah. So I looked at his stats: two points, four boards, one and a half blocks, three fouls in 15 minutes per game. Yeah, he fouls truly impressive foul rate. Uh, but honestly, that's about all I would envision him potentially playing for the Knicks at max would be 15 minutes. And so if he could provide those numbers in 15 minutes, I think it would be solid because basically all that the Knicks need him to do, Tibbs has more or less said. Isaiah Hardenstein is going to play an obscene amount of minutes uh, yes, he is. for the rest of the season until Mitchell Robinson comes back, which hopefully will be a few weeks before the postseason. Uh, if we're not lucky. June, apparently not. Yeah, not not June. I guess I, I don't know why a team would just be like, let us just send some medical records to the league and see if they approve this thing. At which point we would have to shut down a guy for the season that maybe could come back by the playoffs. And who's sign great, for by the way. Who's amazing, Mitchell Robinson. Yeah, he's great. I, I, they they just like wanted to fear monger clearly and just like get the bloggers and the podcasters going crazy for a little bit, which yeah, they did. They, we we freaked yeah. out. Um, 
<laughs> but anyway, I basically just need a dude that can fill in like 13 minutes behind Isaiah Hartenstein. He could foul as much as he wants. Mostly, he can. Hart- you could foul out in 13 minutes. It doesn't matter. I agree. There's no such right. thing as foul trouble if you're a low low minute player. Because Hartenstein like has really reeled his own foul troubles in, and maybe could give Baji some good advice. I don't know. Uh, but really, I think that he just does a lot of what Tibbs would want out of that spot. And as much as I hate to plan things around Tibbs, this is a very low cost investment in a player that could just give you a serviceable amount of minutes until Mitchell Robinson comes back and give you a player that's just honestly more akin to what Tibbs wants. Cause I just don't think Presh Sachua is that dude. Uh, it, it, Tibbs is so reluctant to play him like as little as he possibly can. He puts precious on the court because he's just like, well, you're not big enough and you can't yeah. rebound as well, which is false by the way. He rebounds great, but he doesn't rim protect, which I think is the big thing that Tibbs doesn't really like. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That would be one of those things where I would just be like, well, okay, we'll throw in an extra second round pick if you're willing to swap two way yeah, players. With I, I was going to say, like, two way guys don't really get traded. It's pretty rare. Uh, they don't count a salary or against the cap or whatever. So it's it's a it's a strange. I, I like I don't know how to value Ibu Baji in a trade. I would I would say yeah. I, I'd like what is your sexiest future second round pick you can offer? Let's let's go with that or something like that. Um, but I, I, I like I don't have a good baseline for what what. What do intriguing but raw two way guys go for? Like, I don't know. Um, I'll just say, like, if we get when we get to the part where you were actually making trades, now that I know you love them, I will um, really hold your feet to the fire. That's going to be at least an extra first minimum. This, this I, could I, be the mellow I, trade all over again. This yeah, is exactly. be, you're making me put Mozgov in the deal, man. Just, uh. Exactly. Mozgov's a deal breaker. If it's, <laughs> if it's not Tim O'Fay, it's not getting done. Um, <laughs> they should have waited. It's, it's, it's one of the. <laughs> Uh, I'm still sad about it. Um, I'm curious what happened to Quentin Grimes. What's why is he not in? Why has he fallen out of favor? It appears. So, all right. So the beginning of the year, he was terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so he rightfully got demoted because Dante DiVincenzo was playing really well off the bench and nobody had any issues with that because it was just like Grimes needs to figure something out here. Like just his confidence was shot. He made a comment to the media being like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, I just feel like I feel like I'm not involved in the offense. I feel like I just stand around and wait for the ball that never comes to take shots, you know, whatever. And he, he just in general did not seem super happy with what was going on. That said, I could not blame his teammates for not passing him the ball in the starting lineup because he was just woeful shooting the ball to start the year is really terrible. I, I forget what the percentage was, but you're shooting like in the 20s, which is terrible <laughs> for a dude that looked like he could be shooting in the forties for his career. Um, Then he goes to the bench and he's actually been sort of putting things together again. Now we're to the point where the the, (laughs) things have flipped. And now Gavin and I, in our most recent show, we're like, this dude needs to play more. Like, why are you playing Josh Hart at the two? when you have a Quentin Grimes sitting right there shooting three of four from three in this game. uh, And you're limiting him to 16 minutes. Uh, The big thing that came out today that sort of, uh, I think Gavin and I are going to cover a little more in another show, but uh, news that came out today is that Quentin Grimes uh, is apparently being shot pretty heavily by the Knicks now. So my tinfoil hat theory is that at this moment he's playing better, which they're using to sell him to other teams potentially for a deal. For I, I thought he was great last year. Like I thought he was going to oh, be yeah. a really good role player. Right? The oh, he's defense, amazing. the, the yeah. defense, the shooting, the just like. Um, yeah, he like the sort of just the feel on both ends. Like I, I'm, I'm, I was a big Quentin Grimes believer, and then. Um, all of a sudden it's like, he's just, he's out of it and he's, yeah. he's not, I mean, when you sign, when you get, you know, big ragu and Josh Hart, like those are Josh Hart is the most Tibbs player imaginable. So he's obviously going to play more than, than Grimes. Cause he's like quintessential grown in a lab Tibbs guy. But yeah, if, if I were picking like, Hey, which Nick's role player would I like thrown in this deal along with, um, the salary of a certain Frenchman, give me Q. I would, I would, I would love Quinn Grimes. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole difficulty there becomes. <laughs> I hope that he's not treated as a throw in because I would suck. <laughs> like he, yeah. this is a guy that on one leg shut down Jimmy Butler in the playoffs last year, and suddenly that's just kind of gone out the window in favor of I, I I don't know Tibbs doesn't like him or something, so they're willing to just. Well, you know what? Come move west, young man. Move west, yeah. young man. I'm sure that he would like being somewhere where he could get tons of playing time and probably lots of shots because, like you said, the the Blazers have a shooting problem, and he's got a shooting solution. Uh, right there in his in his uh, right arm. So I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, but you know what? I think we've reached the logical point where it's time to start. Yeah, let's do it. Let's yeah. let's let's negotiate some trades. Yeah. So let's take our let's take our last little break here, and then we'll come back in. We'll talk we'll talk through some deals and mock GM this thing up. All right, I'll be right back in with Mike for the main event. We're going to talk through this trade negotiation and try to figure out what the trade is to get Malcolm Brogdon on the Knicks. But first, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. And around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organize one part of your space and you want to tackle another. Uh, or maybe you're taking your supplements every morning and now you want to actually eat breakfast too. There's all kinds of stuff. And therapy can help you find your strengths. You can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. You don't want to, you don't want to overcommit to things and set yourself up for disappointment. It could be good to talk to someone, set realistic expectations for yourself and and you know, make something happen for yourself in the new year instead of, you know, trying to lose 40 pounds, maybe lose 10 pounds, you know, whatever. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, you should give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. And today's show is also brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays, you can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays as well, and more. And let me tell you, the best thing, even after you get that 150 bucks from FanDuel, they're just going to like keep giving you $5 all the time and just be like, hey, kid, go have fun. Uh, they really want to give you the opportunity to just get free money in exchange for making bets as long as you claim your rewards and stuff. I find that I get $5 bets like all the time. And it's a great way to make a Knicks game a little more fun by placing a same game parlay in there and potentially making a ton of money off that little $5 free investment. So if you want to do that, visit fanduel.com slash locked on and you can make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, we're back in. It's time for the mock trades. And uh, I didn't even get to talk about Matisse Thibel yet, but maybe I'll try and sneak him in here but yeah the uh, money's gonna be hard to make thibel work but i i he would be valuable for the knicks he's such a good defensive playmaker he's such I a know. good defensive I, playmaker. I love that dude i i've loved him since college i understand he has some some uh issues like shooting the ball but he's been shooting, really good shooting the ball really good shooting the ball in a portland trailblazers jersey whether he can shoot a ball in another jersey we'll see but with the blazers he shot it well Shot He's got the really same well. the same thing going on that Hart had going on there. What is it about the Blazers that turns guys that have been good defensive players and middling shooters for their whole career into Ray Allen on the the Blazers, <laughs> and then they go to another team and they shoot their normal percentage again? Well, the the, the second half season, the first half season of Josh Hart, he was magic. The second half season prior yeah, to the Knicks, so he was yeah, yeah he struggled <laughs> struggled a little before bit. last but, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah but in. True. In 22 games last year, Thibel shot 39% from three. In 37 games this year, 37% from three with the Blazers. On, on like, volume. In, on like Yeah, he's shooting uh, across 59 games, 37.8% from three. He's an above-average shooter on almost four attempts a game. Like, he could yeah. shoot. Um, he doesn't do a lot else on offense, but he's such a good defensive playmaker that if you make more, if you are above-average three-point shooter, you are you're a player like you can help almost any team if the Knicks had one more mid range salary to make the money work I think you ask for Thibel and you throw in extra picks and make it happen but I don't know that they do they just need presses to chew it you just need to make eight million dollars not four uh, yeah. that's really that's the trick here um so I think we know the framework of the deal right yeah. it's Malcolm Brogdon for Evan Fournier that that money works like that you can just make that deal no problem um the question is like what the Knicks have picks to give up right they have they have several first rounders my issue if I'm the Blazers and I guess I am for this for this uh for the purposes of, of this exercise the uh the the Knicks have four 
24 first round picks. Is that right? Sort of. Not really. Because they're, uh, they're protected. Let, let me give you the let me give you the the, the quick cliff notes on those picks. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The Knicks have eight first round picks they can trade. They have okay. uh uh four all of their swaps available. So I think four swaps as well. So they could potentially do up to 12 picks and swaps in, in any given deal. Uh they have all their own first round picks going forward. They also have Milwaukee's uh pick in 25 or yeah 25 uh which is top three or four uh, top four protected if it falls within the top four i think new orleans gets it uh which okay. it won't so the knicks will get it uh, so yeah. that's basically a guarantee um and then they have the uh dallas pick this year which is top 10 protected and then top 10 protected once more next year if it somehow doesn't convey again if they if everything goes to hell and they uh tank again blatantly this year and don't get punished nearly enough by the league uh like last year Tanking's and- cool I'm, I'm t- i have no problem with tanking losing on purpose is actually what smart well-run franchises do that's true but that in, is true. in any case, in any case. Uh, the knicks never did enough of it which is why <laughs> which is why they had to get really lucky in free agency um but anyway yeah so they have that pick which is almost guaranteed to convey this year And then the other two picks, they have one from Washington and one from Detroit. Uh, The Detroit one will not convey sooner than like 2026 uh, because that thing is protected top 18 this year, I think, and then top 14 next year, and then like top 10 the year after that. And I think it's top eight the year after that. That's that's the earliest I could possibly see that pick conveying just with the state of things there right now. Uh, Washington picks similar, although not quite as bad. I think it's lotto protected this year, top 10 next year, and then like top six or something or top seven, something along those lines. And then I think after that point, it turns the Washington one turn it turns into two second round picks and the Detroit one turns into one second round pick or maybe I'm flip flopping those. But either way, they're, they're pretty well protected and probably won't convey for at least two more years. It right, be because those bad. teams are truly bad. Truly um, bad. They would need a lot to turn around for them. Yeah, yeah the, I didn't realize the, the Detroit pick is that I think is the Jalen Duran trade. So they, that's they're maybe not even going to end up getting. They'll be they'll be bad enough to never actually trade trade that pick for Duran. Um, yeah, so I, so they don't really have multiple picks, in, or they don't have four picks in twenty twenty four because they're not going to end up with no, those. Definitely um, not. They have two picks, but you could they could trade the rights to future picks in twenty twenty six from bad teams, which I think appeals to me more than. The Blazers have their own pick, which is going to be good. They're, it, right now, it's fi- the fifth. They have the fifth, fifth worst record in the league. So, f- and they have the Warriors pick, um, and the Warriors are f- famously in great shape and not totally, not totally on fire right now. They have the tenth worst record of the league. Um, so, like the Blazers might have two top ten picks, might have two lottery picks. Like they're, I don't think in this draft you want to load up on like how many top seventeen picks can we possibly get. Um, I, I think the value for the Blazers would be a future shitty pick. Like what's the worst team. So that's why I'm saying like, maybe you say maybe the Blazers ask for that Washington pick. They say, okay, give us the, give us the wizards pick because maybe it won't convey for two years, but we think the wizards are going to be, you know, the 11th best team when it's top 10 protected or 11th worst team was top 10 protected in three years. And we're comfortable with it. Um, Are there any picks that you wouldn't put on the table or would you want to be protected more? Is that totally cool with you? I would maybe say like, I mean, just for the nature of the NBA where everything turns over every two years and you never know what things are going to be. If you were like, Hey, I want the Knicks like 2028 20, pick unprotected. I'd be like, eh, you know, let's maybe right, 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 right. Yeah. Maybe instead. How's that? Cause I know what's going to happen this year. I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> in 2028 20, and I'm not desperate like the Lakers or something where I have to trade that. Uh, so that, that would probably be my only thing. But if it came down to like that Washington or Detroit pick, I'm all about that, honestly, because I think that that, you're right. I do think that benefits a team like like the Blazers more, where hopefully if things go right in two years or so, you'll be looking and saying, okay, now it's time to load up on the role players because hopefully we've hit on the draft a couple times and like have that core Scoot Henderson is developing, you know, like like all these guys are kind of figuring their stuff out. And now we're trying to just hit on those role players so then we can, you know, okay, see it up, you know, and like, yeah, exactly. And and, and if, and then you pick in the teens, exactly less pressure and all that stuff. Sure. It's guys are cheaper, all those things. Yeah. So I, I think, I think it would be centered around that pick and Fournier. Sure. Um, the, the question is like, do, would you throw in Quentin Grimes if you're the Knicks or would you, would you want something back? 
I see. I think that based off how the Knicks are operating right now, and this is this is based off the OG trade. I think that they're treating. I think that they would treat Grimes like a pick. So, if your offer that you come to the Knicks with is, "Hey, Team X is offering us," you know, a uh, uh, salary plus a first round pick for Malcolm Brogdon. So we'll instead, but you know, maybe the salary is like a two year salary or something. So they're like, Oh, we'd like it better if it expires. So you get, you know, Fournier is a great, great option for that, for a team that wants to just, you know, avoid any salary tax implications and just clear a bunch of salary and just run with some young dudes. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the Knicks could then say, okay, well you can have that Washington pick or whatever it is. That makes you happy. Cool. And very similar to the Josh Hart deal last year, then where it's just like, right. You know, you trade reddish. Who's, not turned into much since then. And, you know, that was pretty much it. It was like that in the first round pick and that's it. Um, it, the thing that would make Grimes potentially be in the deal would be if there was credible other teams being like, we'll give you two first round picks. And then the Knicks, I think maybe then would be inclined to say, because they're still keeping all this powder dry because they're still, you know, Brogdon might even be involved in this. They're still keeping their mind open to like a, Joel Embiid trade or something like if things hit the fan in Philly at the end of this year. Ogden is or... helpful for that. If nothing else, he makes twenty two right. million dollars next season. Like it'll be valuable to have that big salary slot. Or on he would the, be the huge, books. a huge great sell to, for example, Cleveland, who right. if they if Donovan Mitchell says, "Hey, I want to go to New York," so well right now. <laughs> yeah, like the, he's playing so well, they're playing well. You know, like yeah. so it's. It, but that's the whole point. Like they have a young right. core that's already playoff ready, so they would be like, "We don't want to like blow this up." Like, you know, we would like to get a player back. Then the Knicks would, you know, be like, "Oh, well, here's Brogdon, or here's yeah. Dejounte Murray, or whoever." Like, you guys could still be and, competitive. Yeah, just and and play. like Fournier, you need the money. You need the money to make it work. Right. And having twenty two million tradable sal- twenty two million dollars in tradable salary is has some it's real nice. value there. So yeah, so. I wouldn't quibble over if 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 there was no Grimes. Like I, I would well, want. Essentially, when, what it would come down to anyway. Sorry, I I got yeah. the rail. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what it would come down to is like what the OG trade taught me is that they gave them. Well, they gave okay. They gave the Pistons second round pick this year, which I guess is sort of like a late first round pick if you want to look right. at it that way. Although I don't, because you get a lot less. You get a lot less locked in team control. Yeah, you end up losing Jalen Brown to the Knicks. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I think that they're. They got out of that deal giving up so little draft capital when, like, allegedly Toronto was looking for, like, two, three first-round picks for OG. They got out of it for zero first-round picks. I think that the reason that that happened is because they valued quickly as, like, a first-round pick or two right. and used him in that deal instead. I think that's what they're doing with Grimes now. So I think what would happen is if Portland came to them and said, well, Team X is offering us two first-round picks, but instead, like – if the Knicks were then like, well, we don't want to trade the first because we want to save those for the star trade. We'll give you Grimes instead. And then Portland was on board with that because they're like, well, we want to get some talent in here right now and get them starting to play together and gel together and stuff. Then I think the Knicks would maybe do that. But it, w- it would take another team. Yeah, and I don't think someone's going to – I don't think you're going to get two picks for for Brogdon. So I think I think what it's probably – I think the most likely – and why I don't love the Knicks as a trade partner is because the most likely deal is the obvious one. It's yeah. Fournier and a pick. And why that's while that's fine and reasonable return – like the Josh Hart return is a, is a pretty reasonable return for uh, – uh, for, for what Malcolm Brogdon is, right? Like he's a good, solid rotation NBA player that's going to help a good team win just like Josh Hart is. But like – if I'm the Blazers, I want Quentin Grimes. I want a young, I want a young something to make it work. So while I think this trade is very realistic, and I think this might even be how it could end up going down this way, if I'm in, if I'm in charge, that's like what I would be, I would be, I don't know, demanding. I would be requesting, say, hey, kick in Quentin Grimes. We'll throw you a future second round pick for your troubles that you can trade down the line, and uh, and and because that's that's what we actually want. We actually want a player. Um, you know, a young player that we's under team control that we can move forward with who we think who at least this fake GM values pretty highly. Yeah. I guess the only thing from the Blazers perspective that maybe would like make Grimes slightly less appealing is you do have to make a decision about paying him pretty soon. Like he right. actually, it, it's, it's crazy. Like he doesn't feel like he's been in the league this long, but this is his third year. So this, yeah, you have that- to pay him next summer. Right. Yeah. If you if you choose to, or you could do what the Knicks just did with quickly and just be like, oh, forget it. We'll we'll figure it out later. Yeah, you can with yeah. free agency, and or we're just gonna trade you. Um. So yeah, that's that's the only thing. Like, but I think that if it came down to that, if I were 
Leon Rose and like Portland was coming to me and saying, well, we only have deals for first one first round pick on the table. Then Rose is going to be like, okay, we can get one first round pick from us then. <laughs> <laughs> like, congrats. That's it. We don't really have anyone that's like a throw in young player. Maybe if you, maybe I could be convinced to be like uh, Jericho Sims. Okay. I mean, yeah. I like that's what I was thinking. Like Jericho or precious and precious is probably not, it does not, not that appealing to me. I don't think he has a ton of, a ton of upside. It's fi yeah. fine. Totally fine player. Terrible hands. If you could catch, he'd be a different yes. basketball player. Um, and Sims, I just I don't rate very highly. So I I think the easiest way to get this done is to keep Grimes out of it and say Fournier and the and the Wizards pick and and wash our hands of this. Even though, like again, for my listeners, I'm not super excited about this deal. But in the if we if we have to agree on something, I think this is the way we agree on we All agree right. on it. I would be shopping though. I'd be I'd be hitting the phones shopping after talking to the oh, Knicks. Yeah. Dude, absolutely. I mean, I would too, I, and I'm sure that Portland is going to. Uh, but yeah. maybe the maybe the past uh, past dealings will uh, right. ultimately be enough to kind of convince these guys to just deal with each other again. But exactly. Either way, I think we found the answer here, which is basically the the it'll be the easy choice here. Uh, last thing that I'll close on: if you were going to pick on a scale of one to ten, how likely you think it is that uh, the Knicks and Blazers do business during during this uh, this trade season? What do you, what do you think the odds are? Six and a half, yeah. which I I'm think is pretty say. high. I, I, I have fair, fairly high level of confidence, but not. I wouldn't put it out of lock because I think Brogdon has enough interest around the league that he could go that, that they could talk to several teams. I'm at about a six because I think that I think that whether the fans like it or not, I think I I think that Brogdon would be the backup plan for the Knicks, and I do think I just have this feeling that they're going after Dejounte Murray and that Grimes is probably involved in that. And that's why all of a sudden we're seeing a report today about the Knicks are shopping Grimes. Oh, wait, didn't Atlanta have interest in Grimes like yeah. last year? Like, hmm, like put the dots together there. I think that's the direction they're trying to go. But anyway, we'll see what direction the real teams go. But Mike, this is great, dude. Thanks for popping on and, and talking this out. And uh, I think this was pretty productive. I think ultimately we just kind of reached the same conclusion as last year that, uh, there's probably a deal that makes a lot of sense between these two teams, and we'll just see if they end up coming to that conclusion or not. Exactly. Thanks for having me, Alex. I I, yeah. I truly appreciate it. Of course. All right. And for listeners of both Locked On Knicks and Locked On Blazers, of course, we'll have you covered with any trade news, uh, like right away. We'll get like some live streams up or something, and uh, also we'll have more talks like this i'm sure i know we're going to unlock on next i'm sure you've got some more crossovers coming up to talk to more brogdon suitors possibly beat my offer i know you're going to take it and shop it to all the other hosts you know come back to me if you get a better offer i guess uh but we'll see. <laughs> exactly but until next time thank you to listeners of both shows and we'll talk to you soon peace out everybody